Knowledge for Men, episode 95. Welcome to knowledgeformen.com, where you're going to grow into the man you want to be. Your life will never be the same again. I can guarantee it. Hey guys, one of the questions I've been getting a lot lately is, can you put together a list of the best books and success quotes from all of your guests and combine that into one guide? And so I've actually just done that. It's called the top 30 books and success quotes every man must live by. So out of all of the podcast episodes I've done, over 60, I finally put together this guide and you can download it for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Ryan Holiday, media strategist and prominent writer on strategy and business. He's the former director of marketing for American Apparel, and is basically the man behind the scenes of best-selling authors Robert Greene, Tim Ferriss, and Tucker Max. He's also the author of The Obstacles of the Way, Trust Me, I'm Lying, Confessions of a Media Manipulator, and Growth Hacker Marketing. Ryan, excited to have you on the show here today. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, let's dive in with your favorite success quote, what it means to you and why. So I, I based my last book on a quote from Marcus Aurelius, which I, I now sort of have a version of tattooed on my arm. He says, you know, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. So I sort of have shortened that to this idea of the obstacle being the way. And it's something I, I try to think about in essentially every single situation in my life. Computer eats something I'm working on. How does that present an opportunity to me to start over better? I'm in traffic. What does that give me a chance to think about? My flight's delayed. What does that give me a chance to catch up on? This idea is essentially, if I had to explain that philosophy, it's that we don't control what happens to us. We control how we respond. And by choosing to see the obstacle as the way, we choose essentially this optimism, this idea that it doesn't matter what happens to us. We are going to choose some benefit, however small, from every single one of those situations. So a lot of people think Stoicism or you know, Marcus Aurelius or the other Stoics are depressing. I find them to be very empowering, very encouraging, and very exciting. And that's why it's a, it's a quote that I've tried to live my life by. Mm, I like that. I mean, when something bad happens to you, you, know, you can find the good. You know, it can benefit you. You can find it. I really like that. And before we dive into what I want to be the main topic, uh, your book, The Obstacle is the Way, sure. let's dive into who you are, how you got started with what you do. You've got this incredible journey at such a young age, so let's hear it from you. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, look, it's been a crazy, crazy couple of years for me. I started when I was in college. I was a big fan of, of a bunch of different writers, and I I'd emailed them, and I reached out, and I sort of developed this sort of informal relationship where I would ask them questions, became worship. One of those writers was Tucker Max, who at the time had not written a book. He was just a popular blogger. And I, that was parlayed into an internship. And then through Tucker, I met Robert Greene, who wrote The 48 Laws of Power, who I became sort of an apprentice under. So my story is, is, a, is a very old one in the sense that I identified really successful people that I looked up to. I reached out, I created relationships, and then they advised me, taught me in a way that school couldn't. Um, I, I ended up dropping out of college when I was 20 years old. I worked for Tucker and for Robert. I uh, eventually, through Robert, I met someone else who became a mentor. That's the founder of American Apparel. I've worked my way up through the ranks at that company. So my my journey has been, I think, one. If I was going to define it by a couple of things, it would be sort of, you know, self education, insane reaching beyond whatever is safe or appropriate or traditional. And, you know, reaping a a lot of really huge, totally surprising gains out of that sort of combination of ambition plus education plus hustle. Um, And that's that's got me where I am today. I wrote my first book when I was 25. I left American Apparel. I decided I would write a book. That book came out in 2012. And then I've written one a year since then. Wow, that's quite the story that you've accomplished quite a bit. And so what led you to drop out? Did you feel like having Robert Greene as your mentor was worth more than finishing that college? Yeah, I mean, look, I had a job offer from Tucker. I had a job offer for a man in Hollywood. And then like the thing with Tucker was sort of on the side. And then Robert wanted me to be his research assistant. And I remember thinking at the time, okay, if I was graduating next month instead of starting another year of school and these were my job offers, how would I feel? 
I would feel like college served its purpose and I'd done what I needed to do. So for me, that, that sort of simplified things. Why would I be going back to college, hopefully get the job that I currently have sitting right there? It's like, look, look, if you go to college to play college sports and then you get a draft offer and it's not like, hey, you know, come, come start at the absolute bottom, you sort college has sort of served its purpose. And so for me, you know, I, I didn't go straight from high school to the big leagues, but I used college as sort of a stepping stone to what I wanted to do. Yeah, it's kind of like this old school education where you take on entrepreneurship from a master in that traditional sense and really just following the book Mastery by Robert Greene. Yeah. And you were on this path when you were working with him, but the book wasn't even out yet. But I believe you guys were working on 50th Law at the time when you started working for him. That was the first book that I worked on and then I worked on Mastery after that. So it was very interesting to work on a book like Mastery and sort of see the parallels to what he was talking about. So it was, it was a very surreal experience, very humbling one for sure. Yeah, I actually interviewed Robert Greene uh, in one of the earlier podcast episodes. And I mean, one of the only ways I can really, you know, my analogy for Robert Greene is he's like a modern day Yoda. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So what was that like working with Robert? What was it like just, you know, being with him full time? It was great, man. I mean, I, I think that the thing with Robert is he is very paid, but also very inact, or exacting. And so with Robert, it was sort of like he would give me instructions and I would know that he wasn't sort of fully explaining everything that he wanted. But I knew and I knew that to meet his standards, I had to sort of work my ass off. So it was this sort of ideal that I was trying to match all the time. Like Having read his books and seen just how amazing they were, it was like all I wanted to do was contribute. Like all I wanted to do was have one story I researched be included in the book. And you know, I ended up doing a few more than one, but it was, it was like, there was this thing that, like I was sort of saying earlier, that I was stretching myself to be able to accomplish. And I think that's why I was able to grow really, really quickly was because Robert wasn't like one of those bosses that's yelling at you all the time, that's demanding crazy hours. But what he is doing is holding you to a standard, deliver the results. And so that made me much better just by nature of being sort of in that trial so to speak yeah and that's a key point there you said i just wanted to contribute and i think that's the best position for any mentee to come from i know people question you know how can you get a high level person to be your mentor and i think people feel like they don't have enough to offer to someone at such a higher level than them what, do you, what are your thoughts on this well i think it's both i think on the one hand some people think they don't have anything to offer. On the other hand, people are just delusionally overconfident with what they bring to the table. And so, like for instance, I just did this contest where for my book, Growth Hacker Marketing, I was going to hire someone to do growth hacking for the book. And I was sort of going to walk, the, I was going to let them work on a book campaign and teach them how to do it. And then we were going to write an article about it. Well, you know, everyone wrote in with these ideas and they thought their ideas were amazing. The person I ended up hiring his idea was not very good, but he was able to come up with an idea, articulate that idea, explain the pros and cons of that idea, and give me a reasonable explanation for how it might be executed. And he followed instructions, and he was respectful, and he was reachable. And that's what I was looking for. I was looking for someone that I could teach that I knew would not waste my time, that wasn't crazy, that wasn't unstable, that wasn't all over the place that that didn't lack initiative sort of things right but so many people think it's like oh i went to this school i'm a rock star you better hire me or i'm so smart i've been doing my own blog i've listened to these they think that what they bring to the table is all these skills when really what they they need to bring to the table are reliability trustworthiness willingness to learn you know willingness to do unpleasant work those are the traits that a mentor looks for far more than an MBA from Harvard. Yeah, and just take action. You know, your mentor gives you advice. Go take action, then come back to the mentor and say, "Hey, I did it. This, these are the results that I got. What should I do next?" Yeah, look, like with Robert, Robert would say, "Like, hey, you know, I need these by this date," and I would make sure that I had them before that date. So if they weren't good, I could make changes and. I see this, it's a really simple thing, but I see people make this mistake all the time. It's like, look, I gave you two weeks, 
you came back with it at the end of two weeks and it's not good. So I didn't expect it to be perfect, but I expected you to update me on the problems much earlier in the process. You thought you knew what you were doing because you, were, you weren't able to be cynical and therefore you wasted two weeks of your time, which by extension is two weeks of my time. All right. Sounds like you've gone through your fair share of people there. Yeah. yeah. All right. And as former director of American Apparel, which wasn't a small company when you started, it's been growing ever since. It was a $400 million company when you first came on. What was it like when you were offered this position? You know, Did you feel like you were going to confidently just walk in and know what to do from day one? Or were you going to just learn as you go? It definitely wasn't the latter. It was a slow process. Like, I, Look, I came in. I didn't have a job description. I didn't even have an ID badge or an office. I came in and I carved out a role for myself slowly over time by knowing what I was talking about, having good ideas, being willing to work, putting myself in, inserting myself into difficult situations or problems where people could use help, and solving problems for people. And eventually that became the position that it is. And like, look, I'm doing this interview from American Apparel right now. I'm not the director of marketing anymore, but I am a consultant because this happened. You know, they, they sort of went through some crazy stuff recently, and I was one of the first people that they called. And, and again, I'm, I'm dealing with things that you could say are very much above my comfort zone or what I've necessarily been trained to do, but I can figure things out quickly. And more importantly, I know how to exercise good judgment and learn in situations. And those are the skills that uh, like CEOs and boards and people like that look for because that's what they need. They need people to help them doing what, do what they are trying to do. They don't need somebody to come in and tell everyone what to do. Right. And so are you using some of the principles of the Stoic philosophy where you can see the bad and just deal with it and be frustrated or find the opportunity within it? Yeah. I mean, look, it's it's a chaotic, complicated company that's in a very big state of transition. And there's no question, I think Stoicism was designed for are trying situations like this. Situations that try the individual. I'm not saying, you know, it's very much a first world problem. There's no question. But stoicism is designed for when you are dealing with unexpected taxing events that make you want to scream. Uh, and stoicism is a resource in those situations. And that that's certainly a bit of what the day-to-day -day situation in peril can be like sometimes. <laughs> I bet. And so just kind of drawing back on the quote you said earlier uh, by Marcus Aurelius, yeah. I want to really go and dive into the obstacles away. So let's just pretend I don't know what this book is. You know, I don't know what stoicism is. Can you explain some of the main concepts of the obstacles away so the audience can grasp it? Yeah. So look, the main concept of how you overcome obstacles or difficulties or the things that happen to us in life that we did not plan or would rather not have happened. And then it, what I do is I illustrate through history, people have responded to these situations. It's, it's very much sort of short historical anecdotes that illustrate the various principles of how one lives and breathes this idea of the obstacle being the way. So, you know, the first third of the about, you know, sort of controlling your emotions and your perceptions. The second half is how sort of our actions can turn negatives into positives. And then third, it's it's this stoic concept of the will or willpower, which is about how we sort of take and deal with the things that we cannot change, um, how you deal with things, you know, with perseverance, with this sort of a fatalism, with a with perspective. How do you practice what the Stokes call the art of acquiescence, which is not pretending that you control and change the world to, according to your whim, but instead are a very small part of it and and how do you flourish with that in mind? That Those are the sort of the, the three parts of the book that, again, I'm not in the book. The book is stories from history of people who have sort of dealt with what to deal with. And you just cut out for a second there, but the obstacles away just looks at iconic figures in history and how they turn their greatest challenges into opportunity and actually benefited from them. And since the book, Ryan, was on historical figures, can you share with us a big obstacle you've encountered in your personal life and how you overcame that? You know, my life has certainly been stressful. You know, I drop out of college. I work at these companies. I have controversial clients that are in the media and there's crises, but they are, as you would say, first world problems. I sort of define adversity as waking up every day and dealing with a world that is not the way 
to be, right? So I think in that sense, we've all dealt with adversity. But like, look, you know, to go back to sort of what we were just talking about right now, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. I live in Austin. My family is like, you know, my fiance lives in Austin. My dog is in Austin. My life is there. Um, and I'm, I'm here sort of dealing with a, and I can't talk too much about it, but I'm dealing with a, an unpleasant situation, right? On, on all, and I can sit there and say, this is terrible. What, how did I get myself into this? This is frustrating. I'm pissed off. Why are people doing this? Or I can say, or, you know, I can, I can talk about how I miss my family, how I'm tired, how I want to go home. I can talk about these things. Or I can say, okay, look, this is the situation I'm in. How do I grow because of it? This is the situation. How do I learn things because of it? I'm a writer. What am I observing that will make my writing uh, better, more incisive, more relatable to people? How are there interactions that I'm having with these people that I can use as a chance to, to sort of practice patience or forgiveness or empathy? I've got free time. How do I use that to, to read or to catch up on things that I've put off for a long time? You know, every situation that we're in has negatives. There's no question. But it also has positives we want to look for them. It, all, it, it has opportunities for us to do things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. And it's sort of up to us whether we take advantage of those or we just complain about the negative parts. Yeah, when you view challenges as opportunities, I feel like the pressure and stress is released. It's totally. like it's like a pressure gauge just just comes down and you can start thinking positively and look for the potential benefit in that problem. And Ryan, you touched on this lightly in the beginning, but stoicism can often be confused with not feeling emotion or like being a robot like Schwarzenegger from Terminator, but what I believe the stoic philosophers are trying to say is to not place your happiness on things you can't control. Well, what they're saying really is don't put your personal happiness or well-being on things you don't control, which is external events. So if you take a great deal of happiness over being wealthy, well, that works so long as you're wealthy. But what if the market crashes, right? What if you deal with this unexpected medical crisis that wipes out your savings, right? The idea is to tie your happiness and or your well-being to things that are inside your control. So that would be your actions, that would be your principles, that would be what the Stoics sort of call the virtues, right? It's about understanding that, yes, the world is very unpredictable and at times can be awful and feel uncaring and harsh. And if you are only set up for the good times, you are going to be rudely awaken when the bad times happen and they will happen they happen to everyone huh so does following stoicism remove outcome dependence it, it certainly attempts to nothing can actually do that because we're human beings but that's certainly the that's certainly the one of the under guiding principle undergirding principles of the philosophy it's about saying look my job is to be good it's to be who i am whatever comes of that i'll take it as it comes, rather than I am being a good person to be recognized. I am working hard to get money and being generous so I can have a good reputation. Those are things that you don't control. And if you put too much emphasis on them, it's going to hurt when you don't get them. Right. And there's no way to avoid that. So do you find that stoicism is useful for people in high-risk situations or entrepreneurs? Totally. The two most prominent Stoics are Marcus Aurelius, who's the emperor of Rome, which I would say is a, a position of some responsibility and authority and stress, right? He's also the, the general or the leader of the Roman armies, again, which is a, a position of some leadership and strategy. And then you have Seneca, who was an advisor, a politician and a writer and a, one of the wealthiest men in Rome at, at that time. And then throughout history, there have been Stoics of all types. I mean, most recently you have Tim Ferriss, you have Bill Clinton who reads meditations every year. If you look through history, there's an unbroken chain of prominent leaders and politicians and statesmen and generals and entrepreneurs and the creative arts who have, who have followed and used the principles of Stoicism. And there's just interesting people throughout history sort of living these principles, whether they knew they, they originated with the Greeks and Romans or not. I mean, that's what I tried to illustrate in the book. Right. And in doing all the research for The Obstacles Away, I'm sure you had to read a ton of books and had to do a lot of research. 
And in your own personal life, I know you read multiple books a week. And yeah. my question is, how do you retain the knowledge from all of these books that you're reading at such a rapid rate? I certainly benefited a great deal from knowledge, and it's certainly given me an education that school never did. Um, for me, as a writer, it's about reading things and then putting them to use like in my writing. And that helps sort of create a loop where I'm consuming and then producing based on what I've consumed, and it helps lodge those things in their memory. But I try to read and consume information that benefits me in my life, whether it's in my business life, whether it's how I make personal decisions, whether it's about with my relationships. I try to read information, read and consume information I can actually use. And if I can't, I sort of ask myself, why am I doing that? And that's sort of what my first book is about, which is an expose of the media system. So much of what is created is designed to be distracting and unproductive. And you've got to steer clear of that if you want to get stuff done. Right, right. And you're an extremely busy guy, Ryan. So I'm wondering, how do you structure your day? And how do you balance your busy life with maintaining a social life? Yeah, so I, I try to get up 8 o'clock. I try to do one thing before I check email. It doesn't matter what that thing is. I try not to make email be that thing. I try to write in the mornings for two hours, an hour to move forward on my writing projects. Then I have a to-do list of things that I have to do that day. And I, I just check those things off in whatever order it, it appeals to me at the time. Sometimes I'll have scheduled meetings and I have to jump on those. And then in the afternoon, I try to do some form of strenuous exercise, whether it's CrossFit, running or swimming. I do one of those every day. And then I try to wrap up really early, like five, six o'clock. And then the rest of the day is mine. I might be responding to emails while I'm doing stuff later in the evening. And I try to read and sort of hang out and do things with people in the evening. But I start early and I end early and I try to actually end early. I'm not someone who's out productive because I'm pulling all-nighters. Right. Not a fan of those either. And Ryan, you know, just looking back at what you've accomplished so far at such a young age, you've done so much. Do you feel like moving forward that there's a lot of pressure to continue to produce high level work? If there's any pressure, it's internal pressure. It's not external pressure. I've never really felt that, but I, I do tend to drive myself pretty hard. And that's something I think about, you know, having like, I wanted to be a writer. That's what this was all about. And I'm, I'm working on my fourth book right now. And so it's, I think I can safely and humbly say, like, I am a writer. I'm not necessarily the writer I want to be, and that's not to say I won't continue growing, but I've accomplished what I set out to accomplish. And when you do that at an early age or you do that at any point in your life, you've got to decide, okay, am I going to move the goalpost now and never feel satisfied? Is this the life that I wanted and am I happy with this? Is this what I'm doing here? Um, and that's something that I think a lot about. I don't know if I have an answer, but... I'm reluctant to be one of those people who never feels satisfied, who, who feels like, oh, I, I made a million dollars, now I have to make 10 million, now I have to make 100, now I have to be a billionaire. That seems like a treadmill that isn't necessarily super enjoyable to be on. You know, if you can keep your identity small, so to speak, you keep your goals contained, you can accomplish them and have the things, you can have most of the things that people want out of life without any of that crushing pressure and expectations that that lead a lot of people astray. Yeah, I resonate with that. And Ryan, you're a marketer, so you already are aware of there's internet marketers out there creating information products with content, not even half as good as the books that you're writing. Right. So why have you chosen to write books that sell for $10 versus selling an online course that could sell for $1,000 or more? Sure. And potentially you could be earning more. I mean, I don't know, but potentially it's it's an option. Sure. I don't want to impugn anyone and, and what the choices that they make, but I very deliberately have decided not, not to do that, right? It's funny though, I deal with a lot of internet marketers and they all want to write books and they all want them to be bestsellers. And so that's something I think about, right? It's like, wait, if they have what I want, why would I try to have what they want? What, there might be something wrong there. It doesn't matter how profitable it is. Maybe there's something unfulfilling or unpleasing about that as an occupation. And the other question is, just because you can get paid a lot of money for something, mean that it's 
a good job and it doesn't mean that it's enjoyable. If I really wanted to make money, why would I have gotten into writing in the first place? I should have, I should have, you know, gone to work on Wall Street or something and I could have made a lot of money in a short amount of time and then played golf for the rest of my life, right? I think that's something to think about. It's who do you want to be as a person? What do you want your life to look like? And pick a career that gets you there. Don't pick a career that other people are who want different things out of life and get distracted by that. Right. You know, I think it's really easy to look at someone else and look at their life and think, wow, like they've got it made on the external, but in the internal, you have no idea what that guy's going through or in, in internal battles that guy's going through, uh, whether or not he is truly, you know, enjoying his, his work or if his work is fulfilling in any way, you know, there's a lot to be said there. But now, Ryan, let's jump into the knowledge round. Are you ready? Let's do it. Do you ever have so many books to read that you end up not reading at all? You have so many books in your library on your list of books that you want to read, but you don't know which books to tackle first. I know in all of my episodes, I ask guests, what are your favorite books? What are your most influential books? And they always list three or four. And I always ask guests for their favorite success quote. I find that quotes can be so powerful sometimes, yet there's so many available. So what I've done is I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that I think every man must live by. And these are directly from guests on the Knowledge for Men podcast. And as you know, some of the guests on my show sold their companies for millions of dollars. They're running billion dollar organizations. They're dating coaches. They're health coaches. They're entrepreneurs. They're celebrities on TV. They're mixed martial artists. Just this wide a variety of great minds and I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that every man must live by you can download this guide for free at kfmfree.com again that's kfmfree.com Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives, starting in 3, 2, 1, showtime. Ryan, first question here, what advice would you give to someone who's feeling kind of lost or unsure of their purpose in life? I don't think purpose is something that you find. I think, Viktor Frankl, you, that purpose is something that ensues from principles. So it's about finding out what you believe in, what you care about, what's important to you, and sort of codifying that into a framework. And, and I think the sort of tactical day-to-day -day lifestyle choices come, come from there. And Ryan, what was holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? That's a good question. You know, I, I think with insecurity, I think I dealt with a lot of insecurity and I wanted all this stuff and I wanted it right away. I mean, if, if I didn't get it, I felt bad about myself. And sometimes I look back and wish that that there'd been more patience and more thinking about this for the long haul. And once I let go of those things, I think I stopped making some mistakes that were holding me back. And Ryan, being a mentee of Robert Greene, in what way has Robert impacted your life? Yeah, look, I think the way Robert lives his life is a constant model to me. Like Robert is insanely successful. He sold millions of books. He's influenced heads of state, you know, CEOs, billionaires, whatever, and he lives in a small house, drives a decent car, doesn't dress flashy, doesn't put himself out there. He just does the work because he cares about the work. And as soon as he publishes a book, he thinks about working on the next book. And that's a very humbling, inspiring model for me personally. Yeah, I can get that vibe from him too. Just, you know, you watch his videos on YouTube, his TED Talks. He's, you know, real just casual kind of guy. And now, Ryan, if I put you on an island, what three books would you bring with you? Well, look, I think it's very different to decide what books you're bringing to read over and over again to an island and, and what books were influential to you in your life. But, you know, Meditations of Marcus really very good. I'm trying to think what else I really like. Um, I'm a big fan of biographies. I like Plutarch's biographies. You know, I'd probably take a bunch of philosophy is more that you read philosophy. Every time you reread philosophy, it changes the meaning and it, you understand it on a deeper level. If I was reading for entertainment, I'd probably bring a bunch of biographies or something like that with me. But for me, it's less about, you know, these are the three greatest books ever written and more like there's an infinite amount of amazing books out there and we should avail ourselves to all of them as, as much as we can. Yeah, I like that. And Ryan, what two or three life skills do you need in order to succeed in your field? Um, as a writer, you've got to have patience, 
You've got to have the ability to, like, look, when you're writing something, what a draft looks like and what a final product looks like are very different. And you've got to be able to hold in your head where something is going to go, not what it is right now. Otherwise, you get too discouraged. What are their skills? Like, you know, we talked a lot about books. You can't be a writer if you're not a reader. You can't be a writer these days if you don't also understand how to sell and communicate. All right, and Ryan, scenario here for you. Imagine you had 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell him to do and what would you tell him not to do? Um, I'd probably tell myself to calm the fuck down, to relax, that if this thing that I was working on, which is dropping out, doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world and I would still be successful because I would figure out some other way, which is essentially like you don't need to try so hard because there's always contingencies and contingencies on contingencies and so forth, so on and so forth. And that, that sort of intensity and lack of a vision of the future is something that I think, you know, amps a lot of young people up and makes them add extra stress and pressure on situations. So that's probably something that I would tell myself. And anything that you would tell yourself not to do? Well, sort of both a do and don't do. I don't know what I would not do. I did it pretty well. Um, I think I would just, I'm sure there's specific things that I might point out that are escaping me at the moment, but generally sort of relaxing and taking this with a bit more pause and patience would have served me better. Yeah, that's it's common to hear when I ask that question. And now, Ryan, looking back at your career, having worked with Tucker Max, Robert Greene, and Tim Ferriss, and being director of marketing for American Apparel and publishing uh, four books, you know, what would you say is your philosophy on life and success? Do good work. Work on what you're proud of, what you want people to see and know about. That there, there, there will be times when you are offered money to do things that you don't like are good but the money is so nice that you want to do it anyway right and those are the situations if i had to tell myself to say no to things it would be situations like that in retrospect so my philosophy on life is 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 do work that you're proud of and and sort of understand that that the rewards come from there and those type of rewards are financial both financial and personal yeah, I'm sure you have a ton of opportunities coming your way ever since you left American Apparel. So let's talk about that. <laughs> you know, what have you been up to since you left American Apparel? What are some of your current projects that you're working on? Yeah, so I have a book that comes out September 30th, which is Growth Hacker Marketing. It's sort of my journey through what I think the future of, of marketing and marketing strategy is. That's coming out in paperback on September 30th. So I'm pretty excited about that. And that book came out a year ago, an ebook. It was much more successful than I thought. And now it's like a sort of expanded, you know, revised version of that. So we'll see how that does. And yeah, I, I try not to talk about book projects that are in the works in the writing phase, but, you know, every day I'm trying to get a little bit towards wherever this thing is going to end up going. I'm still very much in the exploratory phase, but it will hopefully, you know, Trust Me I'm Lying was a book. Growth Hacker uh, was, was a book that I was very proud of. Obstacle is the way is a is a book I'm very proud of, and I sort of see them as a, on a continuum, and and hopefully the new book will will take things in a in a in a new direction as well on that same continuum. Yeah, I love what you're doing, and I think this next book is going to be great. I think it's going to be a huge success. I have one last personal question here. And yeah. It's, uh, yeah. You know, where do you see the future of blogging and podcasting going? Well, it's weird. I when you see all these huge platforms, I think people are realizing like these people are selling you something. They are selling you abandoning your own platform to use. And I think at the end of the day, writing under your own name is the smartest, best way to build a brand for yourself. That's not to say you shouldn't do these other things to expose yourself, but owning your own presence is very crucial. I, I think podcasting is great. I would caution people who, who see podcasting blowing up and try to copy or follow it. Like blogging, there's an infinite market for blogging because written content is something where we we have an immense amount of appetite for and we can sort of consume at our leisure. I don't know how people are going to consume all these podcasts that are being created. And most people don't have the skills like you do to, to create a really great show. So I would say do what makes sense for you, what you think your skill sets lend themselves to, don't just do a podcast because everyone is doing one. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I could see that trend as well. So go ahead and give yourself a plug now, Ryan, on how the audience can follow up with you. So ryanholiday.net is my, is my site. 
Uh, you can subscribe to my email reading list where I recommend books every month. Uh, that's on the same site. A little pop-up should come up. It's like 30,000 people now. Follow me at Twitter, you know, at Ryan Holiday, and then Growth Hacker Marketing comes out this month. And the other books are all available on, on Amazon. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for sharing your story with my community and being vulnerable and sharing some of your life lessons with us. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me, man. This was great. All right, that's going to wrap up episode 95 with Ryan Holiday. All right, and as we're approaching episode 100, which is really crazy to say, um, it's been you know almost a year now, about 11 months since I first started this podcast. I'm just, you know, hitting episode 95 is even an accomplishment in itself. Um, we're at about 910,000 downloads uh, to date since the podcast started uh, in November 18th, 2013. So what I'm trying to do is before episode 100, hit a million downloads. So, <laughs> you know, I'm doing what I can over here. And if you've been finding value in the podcast, I would appreciate if you would share it with a friend, maybe one or two friends, somebody at work, uh, maybe a relative, maybe a brother, a cousin, or an uncle. If there's someone that you think could benefit from this podcast and this movement of men striving to crush it in life and health, wealth, relationships, personal growth, their manhood, and masculinity, I think that I could help. So share knowledge for men with a friend. <laughs> and I would really appreciate that as I journey down to get to a million downloads uh, before episode 100. So looks like I got 90,000 downloads to go in about, uh, about two and a half weeks or so. So let's do it. And I think with your help and your support and together we could blast out the message about knowledge for men and share it with more people, impact more lives. Uh, that's the whole mission here. More downloads equals more lives touched, more lives changed, more lives impacted. So share knowledge for men with a friend. And uh, I'd really appreciate that. Again, if you have any anything that you've learned from Knowledge for Men, I'd love to hear from you. Just go email me at andrew at knowledgeformen.com. If you happen to share it with any of your friends, shoot me an email. I'd love to know that you did and thank you personally in an email. So andrew at knowledgeformen.com. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Until next time, guys. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast show. It's been a pleasure having you be a part of a thriving community of men who want to crush it in all aspects of life. I'm on a mission here to inspire millions of guys. And with your help, we're going to make a dent in the universe. Check out knowledgeformen.com for a ton of free content that's designed to help you live a remarkable life. Again, that's knowledgeformen.com. I hope to see you there. And always remember, 2014 is the official year of the crush, where we take action to get the life we've always dreamed of. This is your host, Andrew Farabee, and until next time, let's do it.